Okay, um, so I think we can start. Um, so um, thank you very much, everybody, who are joining this uh, keynote session. Uh, my name is Ken Ito. I'm uh, executive director of uh, uh, Social Body Japan. At the same time, I'm also one of the director at CIMI. Uh, we are very honored uh, to have uh, two distinguished guests today. Uh, the Audrey Tan and the Naoki Oda. Uh, as you know that the two of uh, the leaders in Taiwan and Japan uh, is uh, uh, like a leading discussion on this impact economy. Uh, and the, um, this session is titled as the Building the Impact Economy, Social Impact, Technology and the Democracy. And the, um, um, first of all, let me uh, introduce two uh, speakers today. Uh, Audrey Tan, uh, she's a digital minister of Taiwan. I think we don't have to introduce, uh, you know, the, uh, the background because she is the most well-known Taiwanese person in Japan. Yeah. And, the, <laughs> and also, um, you know, if you look at uh, his, uh, his, his bio, something very impressive is that this is leading the uh, social reform by the civic participation and also uh, promoting digital governance. And we are seeing all different accomplishments during the COVID uh, situation. Mm -hmm. And the, but no, it, it is just a piece of the, the, uh, the, 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 the piece of the iceberg. And the, um, we, we, are, we, we are very impressed to know that his philosophy behind that mm -hmm. and his leadership to bring these different initiatives to the government. And the, uh, the second speaker is uh, Mr. Naoki Oda. Uh, Oda-san is an uh, uh, old like a friend of mine uh, and is my, is my senpai. And the, uh, as you know, that he has been working for the, the Boston Consulting uh, over 20 years. But uh, uh, the, the, the reason why we want to bring him to this discussion is that because of his cross-sector career, and the, uh, he has appointed uh, to the, uh, this, the advisor position to the minister, uh, mainly uh, taking care of the ICT policy formulation in Japan. And also uh, he's known as a leadership team, uh, as a part of a leadership team at the Code for Japan. So, um, and the, uh, he told me that this is first time to have a discussion with Audrey. So I was kind of surprised that the two of the, the, these two gen, the people are like very much like-minded and a lot, have a lot of uh, the common topic to discuss. So before starting, the, let me introduce four key concepts of this session. Uh, one is, of course, the impact economy that we are discussing this transformation of the capitalism that they uh, used to be uh, with the uh, leading indicator as the risk and return, but we are adding impact as a side, like a principle of the, uh, all the, the governance of the, uh, uh, the, the capitalism today. And also the, the other, the keyword is the digital transformation. As everybody, everybody know that the data is the key. Uh, to uh, realize the impact economy. We need to uh, measure the data, uh, both qualitative and quantitative, and how we uh, make it uh, viable uh, to the uh, policy makers or the, the business sectors or non sector is the key to induce their actions uh, to make the social changes. And this idea is also connected with the, uh, the, the the, uh, the trend of evidence-based policy making. Basically, this is the uh, the, the uh, implementation of this idea to the policy making process. So um, the policy are uh, usually uh, treated as a kind of political movement, some interest of some particular interest group or some particular politician. But now we are seeing the different era because we are seeing all the transparency of the data. We can see that this policy implemented and what was the result immediately. We can see, we, we are seeing the TV news talking about COVID, like, uh, uh, and the people, uh, maybe you, ha you have uh, realized that the, we are using like a mobile uh, data to see that how many people is on, on the street today in the particular, like uh, uh, particular area in Tokyo. 
So um, we can understand the impact immediately using this data. And this is expected to be feedback to the policy making process. So this is the basic idea of evidence poli based policy making. And finally, the impact management, which the, uh, the CIMI has been promoting that the, we are trying to uh, realize that a society which that the impact drives that the, uh, the, the social development. Okay, so um, shall we um, start the keynote? So Audrey, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Yes, I yep. believe. Okay. So uh, should I just start sharing my screen? Please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, really happy to be here. Uh, although, as you mentioned, it's our first time in a panel talking together, uh, it will not be the last. So I <laughs> look forward to, to more discussions um, in the future. Um, so yeah, I uh, start with some, some numbers. This is according to Freedom House. They did a country scorecard for the Summit for Democracy uh, for all participating uh, countries. Uh, and of course, Japan and Taiwan leads um, Asia in terms of freedom score and freedom of the internet. <clears throat> and this is very important for social innovation uh, because the key factor here is that we need to innovate with the people, not just for the people. So having the freedom of expression of assembly and so on is the key part, indeed the, the very pillar of social innovation. And in Taiwan, the internet has developed uh, alongside our democratization between the lifting of the martial law in 1987 and the presidential election in 96. We saw the popularization of PCs and the wild web in a span of 10 years. So uh, the first idea I want to introduce is that technology in Taiwan is not just semiconductor, it's not just industrial technology, but also social technology. Democracy is like a social technology that can only be enriched through the joint efforts of all. So uh, ever since I was a, a child, uh, I've uh, known that our government insists that broadband is a human right, reducing the cost for civic technologies. Our network infrastructure allows everyone to broadcast live from Jade Mountain, Taiwan's highest peak, because we believe that a completely open environment with free speech is perfect for letting digital democracy flourish. And so when COVID came, uh, we used this basic infrastructure of health, uh, universal health care, the IC card based on universal health care, the broadband that afforded access for the pharmacies to visualize mask inventory and so on, which I believe is well known in Japan, so I will not go into details here. Uh, but I will share a, another uh, example, uh, which was from last May. Uh, because last May is when Taiwan faced our first uh, wave, first real wave of the Alpha and then later Delta variant. So we needed uh, to shorten the contact tracing from 24 hours to less than 24 minutes. Uh, but inaccurate information uh, would put us at a dilemma of having to choose between protecting privacy and also preventing the pandemic, which is sometimes phrased as kind of trade-off, uh, but we do not want it uh, to be a trade-off. So instead of centralizing contact tracing data to a certain company or to uh, the state, uh, or yielding control to multinational corporations and their emerging standards, uh, we instead sought social sector solutions. So that's the second concept, the idea of a social sector. Just like you can go to a uh, you know, private sector for procurement, we went to the social sector for reverse procurement. <laughs> that is to say, we're not uh, asking uh, anyone to implement anything. On the other hand, we're asking, are there better designs that takes care of both the privacy and contact tracing so so that we may implement it using state budget. So we're crowdsourcing the specification, the agenda, the norms around contact tracing. We're not uh, saying that uh, people in the social sector have to implement any particular thing. So this is crowdsourced agenda setting from the social sector. So by putting out this call for proposals in just three days, the civic technologists in the Gov0, G0V community invented this mechanism you're seeing here based on text messages. Uh, so it works very simply. You don't have to download any app. There's no app required. This is the building camera. Just point it to the QR code. It pops out a SMS screen. 
and you press send and that's it. So it goes to a toll free number 1922 that's already well trusted as the representative number for the Central Epidemic Command Center. But the data does not go to the center, rather it's stored like post-it note for just four weeks at your telecom. If there's no local outbreak in that area for uh, four weeks, then it's just deleted from the telecom. So it's never centralized anywhere. The venue owner learns nothing about your phone because it's between you and your phone company. And your phone company knows nothing about the venue because for them it's just 15 digits of random code. So this is what we call a privacy enhancing technology, a PET. In this sense, uh, we decentralize the storage and therefore, uh, unless you're a contact tracer, there's no way to uh, piece together the complete puzzle of contact tracing. So uh, I went into this detail because uh, the people who design it want us to uh, make sure that everybody understand <laughs> the privacy protecting nature of this design. And this collaboration cannot happen without strong trust across all the sectors. And of course, uh, by adopting the social sector design, we in the government also have to promise that we want to bridge the digital gap for the elderly and the visually impaired so that contact tracing can still be done through measures such as handwriting or stamping and so on. So this is not replacing paper. This is augmenting paper. This is another issue that we had to tackle early on. But with all that said and done, it's just, uh, I think, seven days. And then more than two million venues adopted this uh, way. And it's more than, uh, I think, about a half a billion so far uh, sent uh, this way uh, with no privacy compromises. Uh, so uh, all in all, it's a really successful measure. And because the civic tech originated from this community that uh, has a strong sense of privacy, uh, for example, there was a judge uh, that assessed a police search warrant uh, and said uh, that uh, they have to deny this warrant because uh, it says for epidemic control use only, right? It's the original message in each and every SMS that's sent. So the judge denied the police from accessing this mapping between the remnant code and specific venues, but also went public, uh, wrote a new newspaper uh, op-ed uh, that says it should be illegal for those SMS uh, to be sent to the wiretappers. Uh, and so we immediately convened and the Ministry of Justice said, yeah, that's true. The 1922 SMS does not constitute communication under the Communication Security and Surveillance Act and therefore should not be repurposed for law enforcement, keeping the original intent intact. So I believe a uh, rule by the people is the original intent of democracy. And digital democracy uh, means designing with the people. And so uh, people who wanted to see, for example, in the past 28 days, which contact tracer have access their data for what purpose and so on, everything is radically transparent uh, to, to everyone. So this is uh, a reverse audit. You can do a reverse audit to the contact tracers by authenticating your SMS numbers. Again, mutual accountability ensures that the people-public-private partnership starts in the social sector where the people sets the norm. Through reverse procurement, the state implements the norm and the private sector like the telecom company and the convenience store that posts those QR codes simply implements the norm that they do not have a way to um, go outside of the norm. So this is social sector first design, which is the only way so far that we've discovered that can increase trustworthiness as the pandemic goes on, <laughs> instead of decrease trustworthiness because people uh, who, who do not have a say or participation in this kind of mechanism uh, eventually lose trust uh, in the mechanism. But because everyone can participate literally on a day-to-day -day fashion so that they can actually understand how it works and also improve on how it works. So I think mutual accountability is also very important. Uh, but none of this come out of from a blank state. Uh, the reason why the mask rationing map, the SMS-based contact tracing can happen uh, within just three days or seven days is because there's already a very strong civic infrastructure in the digital realm that allowed this to happen.
What you're seeing um, is the Airbox, a low-cost air quality tracker adopted by many primary schools uh, as a way to teach data stewardship and household balconies. So the citizen science supplemented our government's limited capacity and paved the way for data stewardship and environmental education to be taught by um, young children measuring PM 2.5 uh, and contributing to a distributed ledger so that it could affect the decision for their parents uh, whether to go outside to jog or for a hike uh, that morning is partially dependent uh, on the primary schoolers measuring the air qualities to Gaza. Uh, and instead of uh, banning this efforts as some more authoritarian regimes would do, uh, Taiwan instead encouraged them through the civil IoT program, which expanded this network to areas inaccessible to primary schoolers, for example, industrial parks, uh, because they probably cannot go into industrial park and install air boxes there. But it turns out our municipal government owns the lamps. So we just uh, took, again, the design from the social sector, the citizen scientists, and implemented that on the lamps in industrial parks. So at a time, there were less than 2,000 devices in 2015. But today, there's tens of thousands of those devices that completes the picture around air quality and pollution. So uh, data sharing uh, should be, again, built upon this idea of social sector first approach that allows us formed shared goals uh, together based on evidence that's gathered together. And uh, when the evidence points to multiple possible solutions, there's also a way to crowdsource shared feelings despite those different positions through assistive intelligence or AI. For instance, many passengers welcome Uber's entry to Taiwan in 2015, but it also triggered taxi driver discontent. And again, with the help from the GovZero community, we utilize the POLIS system, as you see here, to invite stakeholders to resonate with each other's feelings. So the way it works is that if you feel uh, similarly to me, uh, your avatar moves toward me. Uh, but if you said no, uh, I don't share their opinion, well, uh, you move farther away from me. But there's no way uh, for people to outvote a minority group. This measures the plurality. This does not measure the headcount. So this allowed us to surface the shared values, which are hiding in plain sight. And er every time we run a police conversation, for three weeks, we see maybe 5% of the ideological statements that people agree to disagree, like whether it's sharing economy or gig economy, uh, but safety uh, or insurance uh, or paying taxes, professional license, and so on. These are the common feelings that were then ratified in the Diversified Taxi Program of 2016. I think this is uh, the most important of all. So um, I think uh, this is the same idea that has worked for many, many different topics. And because of time constraints, I can't go through them all. Uh, but I want to just finally uh, highlight that we found a way to institutionalize the rapid deployment uh, of the social innovation that came from the social sector. Every year, we give five trophies to the social entrepreneurs and public servants that have built something that work on a smaller scale. Uh, but the promise of that trophy is that we'll just um, amplify it to a national scale with all the budget, all the personnel, and all the legal requirements uh, that can then take their idea and put it on the uh, national level. So there's many ideas that start overseas. Uh, for example, in our social innovation lab, there were people sharing uh, the Japanese idea, my uh, that allows people to track the drinking stations to for refillment. Uh, but then it won the presidential hackathon. Uh, and then uh, the idea became a uh, phone cha or home day that allowed people in Taiwan to combine that my idea, which allows you to find the drinking fountains nearby, and Pokemon Go, uh, which is a way to gamify uh, the system to find new friends and collect coins and so on. And so in SDG terms, this is effective partnership through reliable data in a way of open innovation. So um, to conclude, uh, I will just read my job description, uh, which describes a social sector take on the more uh, technical uh, jargons uh, that were at a time quite popular, still is very popular today. But I uh, firmly believe uh, that Japan and Taiwan are natural allies in finding the human-centered way to reinterpret uh, those ideas. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it the Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, 
let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Audrey. This is a um, very interesting, you know, the, the showcase of the how Taiwanese society is transforming. Um, it's a very interesting contrast to uh, our like uh, news uh, articles in Japan, some like uh, manipulation with statistics, like once a four year election decide everything, you know. So I think this is really good, uh, like a point that we uh, it's it's a it's a point and a lot of in reflection to the our discussion in Japan. So Ota san, uh, 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 maybe you know you, you you are well very well positioned to respond uh, to these uh, like uh, opportunities uh, and what. So uh, uh, may I um, ask you to introduce what we do in Japan and your view on how we can uh, progress. Ah, uh, Ota san, we can, we cannot hear you. Um, Ota san, we cannot hear you. Um, maybe why he's uh, um, uh, configuring the uh, ID setting, maybe I can um, ask some question to Audley. So um, this is very interesting to see that, that the, um, so when we talk about like a data, many people have uh, some fear that data is, you know, misused. And also that who, who manage the data, who, 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 who take care of the governance. But uh, um, your like a showcase uh, is the saying that the transparency is the key, so that if the transparency transparency is ensured uh, at the system level, then that will ensure the governance. The uh, on the other hand, is that, yes. is that right? Yes. So um, there's two key things here. One is that how quickly can a rough consensus, uh, a something that we can all agree on on the use of the data, the proper use of the data. That's the first thing. And the second is that how quickly can the bias and misuses around data be discovered and corrected? If the iteration, uh, the agility of those two are as quick as the Taiwanese example, that is to say literally within a week or so, then people actually see those shortcomings as ways to improve each other's mutual trust. But mm -hmm. if uh, longer than a week, if say uh, it requires a year or four years uh, to correct uh, the data bias or to build consensus around data use, then of course it's a net loss for everyone involved, right? Uh, people can say, uh, just trust us, uh, but then uh, people would not have a way to address the shortcomings or uh, maybe you do trust uh, your clinic. Uh, and your clinic does trust uh, some uh, IT vendor, but it doesn't mean you trust the IT vendor. <laughs> and so every time that there's uh, this kind of situation occurs without a good enough consensus making or correction mechanism, then it's uh, everybody's loss. So I think uh, we need to invest in the social infrastructures of mm. trust building and mutual accountability, even before we think about deploying anything that's wide scale. I see. So, Otasan? Oh, no, we cannot hear you. Um, so maybe you, our colleagues, you know, could help you. Um, so, um, and the other uh, interesting point is that this uh, uh, formulation of trust or consensus uh, by like uh, making all different opinions clear. So this is the very interesting contrast to our like a cyber space like uh, uh, political debate that the two are trying to find the enemy and the, the, the attack it and mobilize all different opinions but uh, you're saying that this is simultaneous uh, communication the, the, the mutual communication will eventually form a consensus in a very short period of time that is correct so um 
I think um, it's the same people, the same citizens, constituents. It's just the space that is different. That is to say, on Facebook or other more in the social corner of social media, the focus is on creating this addictiveness uh, of outrage, right? When people are enraged about something, Facebook attracts you to have a back and forth. Uh, but in the uh, police system that I just introduced, it's more a pro-social social media so that people compete not on fighting each other, but finding things that can convince people of different feelings. And because there's no reply button, if you are a troll, you don't have anywhere to grow, right? So, so the space itself is conductive for the dynamic, nonviolent communication. This is exactly like in a physical town hall or campus or a public park. The space is designed for pro-social conversations. We would not take our town hall discussions uh, or deliberations into the, the nightclub uh, where the music's very loud. You have to shout to get heard, addictive mm -hmm. drinks, private bouncers, smoke for your room, right? And I have nothing against entertainment sector. I just think that we should not uh, uh, put our <laughs> citizens' conversation there. Uh, we should have dedicated spaces in the digital realm. Thank you. I'm very interested in this because, you know, in the impact assessment, impact management space, we always talk about this uh, consensus. Impact mm -hmm. information will lead, will bring the people to the same table to discuss mm -hmm. and leads to the conclusion at the, the eventually. But our image is that it's a physical meeting, um, like a kind of town hall kind of meeting, presenting the uh, the, uh, the uh, result of assessment and the people listening and the, like a this like a panel discussion type of setting but actually it doesn't have to be like that so we can do it in the simultaneously and the like indirectly in the cyber mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so That's now for the exactly is back. Right. and i think uh the voice is back yeah okay no uh, can you hear me yes okay <laughs> yeah Okay, so um, let me share a few slides, and uh, thank you for having me today. Um, so, okay. Uh, wait a moment, I, I'll switch to the, to the other PC. Okay, good, good. Mm. Okay. Yes, we can see your yeah. screen. So, um, so as um, um, the Ito -san introduced me, uh, my activities are across the three sectors. Um, the private sectors I've been working with Panasonic and Toyota uh, to develop the, the to promote smart cities, uh, mainly in rural areas. And in public sector, um, I have been uh, the advisor to the minister of ICT uh, for almost four years, but uh, nowadays. Uh, I became a member of the council, which was set by the Prime Minister Kishida-san uh, to promote the vision, the, the called uh, Digital Denyen Toshi, uh, which is a meeting the, uh, the digital technology and the rural areas. And uh, thirdly, um, I'm actively uh, involving to the uh, movement called the Civic Tech, as Audrey introduced, uh, which is aiming to uh, promote the, the, the movement that where the citizens uh, tackle social issues by using uh, the technologies. And based upon those activities, um, in terms of the uh, relationship between the social and the technology, there has been two questions uh, which are very important to us. The first question is um, that there is a trend or I would say sentiment after 2010, uh, which is called the uh, tech rush the technology and the backlash, um, which is the, uh, the people, uh, the few, the anxiety, or even uh, resistance to technology, to use of te technology. The first question is that uh, faced with the global pandemic, has a tech rush that being put uh, on hold? And it seems that the, there are two uh, schools uh, around that question. 
Uh, the one that, and a half years ago, uh, there was a very important and interesting dialogue between the two persons. One is the oldest son here, and the other is the, uh, um, the Yuval Noah Harari, known as, uh, o, as a author of the uh, Homo Deus and Sapiens. And, <coughs> and uh, uh, Harari urged that um, looking to the future, there is a great risk to, to humankind, uh, which is the, uh, the technologies, uh, namely data and algorithm, are going to uh, influence or even control our mind and thinking. And this is very difficult to resist to that trend. Uh, that is the, his opinion. And Audrey Sun, uh, it is very uh, easy for her to, to share her opinion here, but uh, in the dialogue, um, the, her position is very, uh, the, uh, the, very different. And uh, she urges that the, uh, the, the uh, defining algorithms as a code. And code includes not only the program or algorithm, but uh, uh, more generic general rules. And the, in the very near future, uh, it is very easy for us uh, to participate and contribute to making rules at the any time. So this is a very the near future. And uh, my, my opinion uh, around the, this question is that uh, since um, I've been uh, uh, involving to the civic tech movement, um, the technologies are becoming more, um, uh, uh, be become more uh, democratized and it is very uh, easy for us to use that uh, to tackle social issues. I'll give you one example. Uh, two years ago, um, the Tokyo metropolitan city um, has um, decided to uh, create a coronavirus information site uh, uh, by open, uh, open source technology. And the more than the 300 citizens, uh, including the, the junior high school students, and a senior person um, that developed the site uh, within a few days. And the, the project has, 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 uh, was managed by Code for Japan. And since the, uh, the, the, the website uh, was built uh, by open source, um, the, the code has been shared by other cities, and the Hokkaido and the Okinawa and the Osaka and the Kyoto and etc. And uh, more than 20 million people use that site, and uh, more than 60 cities use the pro the program. So this kind of stuff uh, is going to happen in the very uh, in the very near future. And that is first question. And the second question uh, is more uh, general one: um, the how to live with coronavirus. And in the 21st century. Uh, if we remember what's been happening, we have been suffering uh, from the pandemic very periodically. It is said that there are many causes, uh, including the, the soil have been heavily damaged. The soil uh, is very effective to um, the control the, the, the virus, but uh, it's been very damaged. Or, you know, the humankind have been very close to, too close to animals. And there are many other reasons, but the, it is said that um, the pandemic, uh, it's very difficult to stop and will continue uh, in, the very, in the future. So we often use the, the word uh, new normal, but uh, now um, the second question I, I, I'd like to raise is that uh, um, how we think about open and sparse space. I'm explaining why this is very important. Um, the humankind have been made many innovations, but uh, one of the great innovation is urbanization. So urbanization has been leading uh, the society and the economy. And uh, what is urbanization? Uh, in the left hand side, uh, if you look at the diagram, the urbanization means that uh, we uh, have been moving uh, sparse to dense, and uh, close, uh, open to close. So this is the urbanization. 
but you know, the nowadays, uh, it is very risky to uh, live in the uh, dense and closed space because of the coronavirus. So the second question is uh, how to um, find the value in the opposite side, which is dispersed and open space. So in the very near future, uh, I think the, uh, the, the space and area value uh, will be renovate based upon the, uh, the how dense the space is or how the air, air is um, the floating or how the people are moving. But the question uh, is, um, the, since the, the urbanization is a great innovation, that it is economically makes sense, making sense. And uh, urban is very at attractive to people. The urban is uh, the place where the new cultures and the new innovations and new ideas are emerging. But on the contrary, if you look at the, the, the open space, which is basically rural areas, they are very struggling. The infrastructure, including road and the water or energy are very high and it's very hard to maintain. And there's the, the, um, the, the power, there's no power to attract people. So in order to the, uh, refine uh, the value uh, in the open space, uh, we, need, uh, we need to uh, innovate. Uh, first, the, uh, the infrastructure by using the, uh, um, uh, by using the uh, off-grid technologies, and also to create um, kind of the attractiveness um, within that space. That is, that is the second question. So in terms of the society and technology, um, I think the, uh, the first uh, agenda is um, not let ourselves get hot, but uh, we had the society and system to make the society a better place. And second is the uh, um, since the, the pandemic will continue periodically, it is very important to, cre to create value in open space space, mainly in rural areas, by using technologies. Those questions I'd like to raise uh, to stimulate the, the, our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oda -san. Um This is really a um, nice way to in interpret that, that our context uh, to Audrey and the audience. So, I, but I'm seeing the common keywords like uh, it's it's autonomy and mm -hmm. centralization. Yep. And the um, these two principles are applying in a different setting. But maybe we are seeing this uh, um, the in innovation in the IT and also uh, our uh, like a change of social system to more participatively uh, like a setting will make these concepts enable uh, to implement in the real setting. So um, thank you, Walter san This is very um, insightful, um, the, the idea. So um, so for the, the, our discussion, I have several uh, agenda. The one is that maybe everybody's wondering that how um, this uh, the Taiwanese response to the COVID was successful because um, if you want to make the data transparent, maybe the, the, there's a, some people want to stop it because I know that all the government officials, something responsible for the, to do to, to organization, uh, won't, don't want to disclose the data. Um, maybe this emergency, emergency situation will make it enable, uh, made, what was made, made, it, made, made it possible. But uh, uh, could you tell tell us about more like uh, challenges or some processes mm -hmm. um, the you have experienced during the um, uh, during the the COVID time? And also maybe this is the same question to Ota San. Mm -hmm. um, the concept itself uh, is is good, but uh, if now you are insider and mm -hmm. the Japanese government yep. and they're trying to like drive this change. What are the, the major challenges and the to do we need to overcome? So maybe this is the same question to for, for two of you. So maybe Audrey, uh, you can okay. start. Yeah, I read on Twitter that I spoke too fast and interpretation did not have time to catch up. So I will <laughs> speak slower 
with fewer words. Um, I think the most important challenge is that people who see things that are invented after the pandemic rightfully worry about the cybersecurity and privacy impact, and it takes time for adoption to happen. For example, when we rolled out the SMS-based contact tracing on QR code, because we ensured if you don't have a smartphone, if you have a flip phone, you can still manually text the 15 digits to 1922. So it's very transparent based on easy to understand concepts like SMS and QR code. At exactly the same time, there's also another system going on called the Taiwan Social Distancing App, which is based on the same principle as Cocoa uh, in Japan. It's a Bluetooth-based exposure notification system. Although it is also privacy preserving because we've never used Bluetooth this way. It took much longer for people to understand and it never really reached the critical mass uh, to make a real difference. So we primarily relied on telecommunication, SMS, and so on to shorten the contact tracing. Of course, I personally still use uh, Bluetooth, but I have a real difficulty convincing <laughs> other people to do so. Uh, ours is also open source like Japan. So it's not about uh, its cybersecurity issues. It's about uh, the time it takes to trust a new system. So the heuristic that we use is just to reuse components pre-existing before the pandemic. The innovation is in how to combine those, not in introducing entire new systems. That's my answer. Yes, um, uh, we understand that is more on our perception, a feeling of safety. Um, how do you think, Otasana, are, are based on the Japanese context, what are the challenges on this uh, digital democracy uh, implementation? Okay, um, so there are many challenges, but uh, let me talk a bit about the digital agency, which was created um, the last September. Um, the, there are 600 people working and uh, across the three areas. One is the, uh, the governmental service, and the second is the, uh, the healthcare, and the third is the education. Um, the, um, in terms of the, uh, the use of data or data transparency, uh, there are many important things, um, but one of which is the, uh, the national ID, uh, which it can be used to aggregate data, your data or our data. But uh, there are difficulties around the national ID, the code my number in Japan, uh, because of the, uh, the distrust to the system. Why distrust is uh, happening? Um, I think the, uh, there's a, the gap between the government and the citizens. And uh, in Japanese, uh, the government is often called okami, the upper place, the upper distant place. So they don't trust the, the government. But uh, in order to use the, uh, the national ID, uh, people uh, have to trust the government and uh, participate uh, to policy making. But uh, nowadays, the, what is happening is a very uh, opposite way. So the participation and trust is very important, are very important than the challenge to the government. Thank you. Yes, it, I think it makes a lot of sense because uh, we are all, always discussing the trust building uh, in the governance only. So the, uh, how, what kind of process we need to follow to, uh, to nurture trust between different stakeholders and this solely should be applied uh, in the uh, in the process of de developing digital democracy because we need to have a such trust relationship between people and the government. Thank you. Uh, and the uh, maybe the other um, so question that the uh, people are very interested in is that the um, in the in the COVID situation we have a lot of debate uh, both domestically and internationally. And the um, some people started to say that this uh, uh, the um, this, like a civic governance is a beautiful idea, but who lead the policy implementation? And the some people started to say that they, we need more, have more authority and power at the government side. And the, maybe the missing piece 
uh, of our like uh, recognition of this 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 uh, space is that so although you mentioned it's a people procurement uh, and the um, but in order to make this happen we need to have more resource at the people's side right so we need to have more idea that could be the counter power to the government like a decisions um also that the um like uh, uh uh like we we need to so we need to have such a uh, resource uh so i hear that like uh otasan story that the uh some call for japan developed this uh, system mm -hmm. for the local governments but that was result of accumulation of such experiment in the different the different ways but um so maybe these are uh, the uh, number of challenges uh, to 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 realize this is uh, democracy and also civic participation. So, um, what's the uh, like process we can we can follow? Um, we, maybe we can we can start from or maybe this is the maybe your your mm -hmm. job description your, your job, part of your job description at the mm -hmm. committee at the mm -hmm. digital ministry, but the digital agency. But uh, how do you think about how we can? uh like a, how we can foster this participatory approach mm. uh yeah if i can the be very honest um the and the, i i told you that the, the trust and the, the participation are very important but unfortunately uh, according to the survey uh conducted by edelman uh, trust to the national government in japan has been very low that is a fact we have to admit that but the uh, uh, good thing is that uh, the trust to the local governments uh, is very high in Japan. So I think the, uh, at national level, um, the very the quick um, the win or the quick change uh, is a bit difficult to happen. But if we look at the local government, uh, we can install the, the for, for example, digital platform called Decidim. Uh, which was invented, uh, uh, born, which was born in Barcelona ten years ago, uh, to the local government to accelerate participation and direct the people uh, to uh, the make uh, the suggestions and even to make rules. And the, the, I think that is a way to show um, the the new the, uh, the op uh, opportunities and the, uh, to the central government, and the central government can run. Uh, to change uh, its behavior, uh, to make the, the the more the trust and the, the transparency. I see. Thank you. So, how about you, Lida? Maybe um, maybe some Japanese people are interested in knowing how did this uh, you get the, such a participation from the city. Uh, Ito-san, uh, can, can can I share a one one little episode? Ah, uh, yes, please. Uh, and and uh, about uh, one year ago, uh, the Code for Japan uh, worked with the, the Kakogawa city uh, mm -hmm. to introduce the the the, the decidim. But uh, there are the, at, the, at the beginning there are many you know the anxiety that the the uh, you know the the people are really the pushing the complaints to the local government by using decidim. But uh, when we started, um, there's a the good surprise. The, the many high school students participated and they make very constructive suggestions. And the other people, the senior people, learned uh, uh, by that and changed their behavior and mindset. So that kind of did a change uh, could happen in many other places. Yes, so uh, that I think that is a point of the discussion today. That may, we, when we talk about the discussion of digital agency or like a, the, the like a civic tech, that people think, oh, this is a big challenge to the government. But actually, that the challenge is on our side. That mm -hmm. how we can nurture a society that the even the high school students willing to participate in such a such a such an activity or like a air pollution, you know mm -hmm. that. Uh, assessment so on and uh, i feel that the Taiwanese society has a uh, interesting uh, unique like attention mm -hmm. of such like uh, uh like a participation because it's a such small island country we see all the uh like a diplomatic like a pleasures outside so um maybe that is the one external factor 
But mm-hmm. only so, can you like uh, maybe you know the give give us some example or your idea that how this uh, uh, civic participation is promoted and ensured in the Taiwanese society to make this uh, like a people's participation happen? Yeah, uh, thank you. Really good question. If um, the reason to start a decidim or council or in Taiwan it's called join, if the reason of adopting these systems is to implement better solutions to existing issues, then it will create a burden to the public service because they have to explain all the context around feasibility. But if we move it to the front and say, we use this system mostly to identify emerging things that our public service have not yet understood, Mm -hmm. then it is a net plus for the public servant because there's more people scanning the horizon, so to speak, to identify key trends and that largely do not cause a conflict with existing resource allocation. So when we roll out such systems, we ensure that we crowdsource the petitions and so on before we even go to the budget allocation or regulatory planning stage. So that is why in Taiwan, the joint platform with more than 30 million visits in a country of 23 million people is a lot. Most of those ideas were horizon scanning, for example, there was one talking about banning plastic straws from bubble tea takeouts, Uh, but it got a lot of attention, uh, but it doesn't really change uh, any particular regulation. It's more about signifying a importance um, uh, at a time, uh, a, a picture of a sea turtle choked by a straw. And so uh, that went viral. And of course, the petition uh, collected 5,000 signatures very quickly. But when we uh, face the petitioner in a face-to-face meeting, we run such meeting twice every month, uh, we discover she just turned 17. She's a high school student. And I ask her, why are you raising this petition? And she says, it's our civics class assignment. Uh, The civics teacher just ask the student to find something that's interesting for the society to raise it in the petition. So I think uh, we are normalizing this idea of citizen participation so much so it could be a homework assignment and we make it very visible. So the uh, person, uh, Wang Xuanru, that raised this petition, now 19 years old, is already our cabinet level commissioner on national action plan of open government. She's part of our steering committee now, and I make sure to call her Commissioner Wang (laughs) whenever we meet (laughs) so that uh, we are not blocked by the seniority culture. Instead, she has this title and the status uh, to push for national level reforms. So I believe uh, the high school students are really leading this horizon. And the more that we can shift the conversation to the problem definition stage, the higher a social status we attribute to those social innovators and contributors, Mm -hmm. the better would it be perceived by the public servant, like they're actually our allies. They're not here to just complain or to criticize us. Thank you. So I'm seeing that such an enthusiasm of Taiwanese people that they realize that this is a great opportunity for people themselves to demonstrate their ability to offer something like of the new ideas. And they, maybe that is because you are still a kind of, uh, I'm sorry to, to say that this is a new country that the, it's just a 30, 40 years ago that your martial law was lifted and the people started mm. people are allowed to speak anything they want so they still remember that what was happened during that time and the how uh, how we uh, how like uh, how precious that how valuable that this freedom of speech or participation to the society uh, is so maybe that's something we need to remind ourselves in japan how do you think all the time yeah 
Okay. Um. And the so um. So this is all like connected to our like discussion in Japan about impact. So we are like always translated all these information like uh, all uh, like uh, good like academic like uh, resources produce all all different reports uh, data. But uh, one is that this is not circulated uh, like uh, distributed among the, in in the market. And the other uh, the frustration is that the um, maybe this is all like uh, uh, printed at the paper based either even the PDF uh, and the uh, PDF form and the we have difficulty to uh, the utilize data these these data to um, to to implement it in in the policy making process. And maybe, um, Otasan, maybe your view that how we can um, overcome these difficulties that the, so our, our theme for this two day session is that the transition to the impact economy. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, I think everybody agree that the data, data transparency is the key. But uh, what uh, like uh, uh, steps we can make this impact man management idea into the uh, like a public uh policy or public governance space um well um there are the the many uh the viewpoints to discuss um the discussion but uh i'll raise one one viewpoint uh which is that um the some asian countries including taiwan and japan the, and even the the south korea are in a very unique position uh, to accelerate the public-private uh, partnership uh, to, you know, the promote the digital transformation. And if you look at the, uh, the European countries, um, the tax and the social securities accounts for 70 or 80 percent of uh, national income. The meaning the government is very big. And the government is very active to accelerate digital transformation, not, to in, not only in public services, but the education and the health care. And if you look at the, uh, the America, the situation is very opposite. And, uh, you know, the tax and the national uh, and the, and social security accounts for 25% of national income. Uh, Taiwan and the Japan are somewhere between, you know, the 30 or 40%. The meaning the government uh, can play a partial role, an important but partial role to make the, the social innovation happen. So in major areas, including the healthcare and the education and et cetera, the public and the, the people, uh, private sectors, including the social uh, the organizations, uh, should collaborate, uh, not only to, to accelerate the use of data, but uh, to you know the, uh, create a very important critical platform in education, and healthcare, and disaster, and areas. That is my opinion. See, um, how about you, Doli? That I, you, you, maybe you, uh, your showcasing project a very like a uh, good example. But I'm, I'm sure that you have some like uh, uh, struggles in some part of your past like experience. And the, uh, um, how do you think about that? The what, uh, what makes like uh, this. Uh, like uh, what 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 uh, effort could uh, make uh, the the make it progress? Um. Yes, um, I, I think um, data is very broad a uh, term. It's like asking um, how should we utilize text in our policy making. It, it's so broad; it's very difficult to to analyze because there's no norm around text, right? There's a norm around uh, academic papers, reviews, and so on. There's norm around journalism, checking of the sources, fact checking, and so on. But there's no norm around text. So similarly, when we digitally transform text to data, I think the point here should not be that we should uh, amplify the use of data because it's too broad, we should instead, I think, say two things. First, if there are existing norms around the text, 
that people already respect. It could be about contact tracing, uh, writing their registered names. It could be around fact checking of journalism uh, and so on. When we digitally transform that into data, we should not abandon that social norm. Because if we abandon the social norm, the social sector will be opposing digital transformation. We should instead say, whatever norm you care about text will care more with data. So this is very meta, but I think this is the key to overcome the struggles uh, that comes from the social sector, mm -hmm. which is why I think both Taiwan and Japan uh, took a leave no one behind attitude when it comes to digital transformation, because we're very realistic. We understand this is the only way that this could work uh, mm -hmm. with the blessing from the social sector. This is the, the first point. And the second point is that whenever things are about personal data and privacy and so on, the first impression really matters. If the first impression is a privacy enhancing technology that makes data even more private than text, then people will voluntarily do digital mm -hmm. transformation as in the case of SMS as based contact tracing because people see, oh, their venue owner, they don't learn of my phone number anymore. So it's even more private. Uh, mm -hmm. But if we do not have such a demonstration on the first try. It's very difficult to fix that on a second or third try because the first impression is already that, oh, this may be quick, but it's less safe. But the feeling of unsafeness, uh, it takes months or years to overcome. So uh, on the first try, it's uh, worth it to spend more time and money on planning and make sure that data is more privacy preserving than text. That's my two points. It's all very meta, but I think that's uh, my personal experience. Thank you very much. Actually, we are receiving some of the questions from the audience and uh, one of them is very valid to our discussion today. So let me just uh, bring it to this, uh, bring to the table. So mm -hmm. um, this person is asking that how to ensure the feeling of safety um, in, the, in the cyber space like a discourse. Like uh, you, we know that this. Uh, um, if you make the uh, like uh, make it anonymous, and the people know that the people understand that the, uh, I will not be you know identified. Uh, you know to 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 uh, this is this is maybe different discussion. This is not the data, but if we uh, cyber if we look at the cyberspace discussion, uh, like uh, uh, norms, uh, and the uh, we know that all the uh, like hate speech. You know, type of um, discussion in different, uh, like uh, um, uh, different, like uh, 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 um, different web pages or you know SNS, you know, type of things, and the so um, uh, like uh, uh, this a privacy uh, discussion, and also that the uh, like conflict of these uh, different like uh, values and opinions seems like. Uh, have some contradiction. So, um, how how's your view that we can we can how we can see the uh, reconciliation of these 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 two topics? So you don't have to disclose your names, um, you know, yeah. origins. Then yeah. you know people suddenly you know are very offensive. So to say that you are totally wrong and the, mm -hmm. these debates like heat up. So we are seeing, uh, so, and also that we are seeing this like a uh, division of all the uh, like opinions, people trying to divide that you are at the that fraction, we are not. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. like- but, uh, but, but the people who espouse his speech on social media and get a lot of retweets, many are using their real name. <laughs> So I, I don't think there really is a strong connection uh, between uh, pseudonymity uh, and uh, uh, hate. I think pseudonymity is very important because it allows people who are in a situation of power imbalance to be judged by their values, not be judged by their age or whatever rank, uh, the social rank that it has. But a pseudonym need to be continuous so when the 17-year-old uh, uh, raised the petition, she chose the pseudonym uh, 
I love elephant and elephant love me. It's a uh, whimsical pseudonym, uh, yeah. but a pseudonym uh, persevered, right? The pseudonym has its own life. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, she registered through SMS. So she knows that if she says something that's um, criminal, um, the SMS can be used to, to track her. So it's not like she's uh, void of criminal responsibilities online. But uh, having a stable pseudonym, I think it's still important. And I don't think there is a contradiction if we can decide to build such spaces that doesn't amplify hate speech. It's the design of the space that matters, not particular pseudonymous actors. I see. Yes, I understand. So that the Satoshi Nakamoto is a very known, but we <laughs> never never know that who is he or she. So maybe the same thing. So um, how's your view, Otasan? Well, um, the cyberspace is relatively new to us, but uh, we're learning uh, how to live in the space. And uh, that's a word called uh, DQ, the digital intelligence. And the uh, you know, the, to live in the real space, uh, we use the, the IQ and plus the EQ. And, uh, you know, the in order to, to have the better time in the cyberspace, the DQ is very important. And uh, uh, it is uh, the program at school uh, to learn about the DQ, uh, including the, uh, the, you know, competency and the, the skill uh, to have uh, the better time in the cyberspace. Thank you. Um, yes, um, I also realized that uh, this uh, situation in Taiwan, uh, when these uh, students involved in the uh, this uh, cyberspace like uh, discussion or like uh, some other petitions, uh, they, that these people say that it's a part of the assignment. So I mm -hmm. think that's a nice way that the uh, the Taiwanese education system like uh, um, incorporate that the uh, like. Uh, new type of uh like a literacy uh to participate in the the cyberspace discussions okay and also I, and uh, if i talk uh, or to talk to talk a bit about the privacy and mm -hmm. um, i think that this centralized decentralization is very important and you know nowadays our data uh is owned by the big uh, brothers the government and the big IT companies. But uh, this is our data. So, um, you know, it is expected that the people are empowered to use and control our own data, mm. which partially was realized by the, the rules like GDPR in Europe mm -hmm. and the, 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 the many discussions are going around um, the, the data portability and data ownership, which is very important to secure the, the privacy. Mm. I see. Um, thank you very much. So um, unfortunately, the time is uh, approaching to the end of the session. Uh, and I think we have learned a lot of uh, like uh, the, the, the ideas that which these uh, two speakers have shared with us. So um, the initially that, you know, when we talk about uh, like a digital democracy and impact economy. And we thought that this will be kind of reform agenda for the government. But uh, this a participatory model, uh, you know, is bring this agenda back to us. And they, I feel like we need to empower ourselves more, you know, uh, and the, uh, we have, a, actually we have already have a capability you know, we can, we have uh, all equal access to the cyberspace and we have uh, all uh, equal power to express our opinion and the new ideas. So, but maybe we need to um, think more about how we can design the governance as uh, Audrey mentioned, that it's not about the uh, the privacy itself, but it's maybe the more the design of the, the space that matters uh, and the, all the, te the technical like uh, uh, like innovation will be the supporting factors uh, to to make this space happen. So I'd like to take the uh, like uh, messages uh, from these two speakers to the audience today that what we can do, uh, you know, the, as an immediate action that we have all different stakeholders, the government people, the business, the academia, and the social sectors. So um, maybe Otasan, maybe you can um, like uh, uh, like uh, share your message to us that the call for actions 
um, for 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 next decade. Okay, uh, I would uh, suggest um, that we start from I on myself uh, when it comes to the uh, the the better relationship between technology and society. So we tend to think about the big thing, something big, but uh, um, we can start from the the very you know the small thing. Like uh, within the three meters around us, uh, to make the uh, the the town the better place, or to make the relationship uh, within the family or with friends or with the the, the community uh, the better one. So that is the uh, the opportunity of the, the hacking. The hacking meaning the the make the the our place a better place, better one. I think that is a very pragmatic and a very effective approach uh, to reverse the, uh, the relationship between technology and the society and the promote innovation. And uh, in other words, uh, we can start from I and uh, the collective I becomes we and uh, eventually we lead to the, the solving the, the social issues. That is my message. Thank you. We need to nurture our own field to make the country a better place. Yeah. Good. How about you, Lee? Um, well, um, my call to action has always been the same, uh, is to be fast, fair, and fun. And it's important to know that these three are not fungible. If you design something that works very quickly, that is very fair, but it's not fun, then it will not catch on. Yeah. Uh, all the three pillars uh, need to be together. So just uh, I echo um, the sentiment that it doesn't need to be perfect. It should just iterate on the existing status quo. So a little bit faster, a little bit more fun, a little bit more fair simultaneously. And that is to increase the virality, the basic reproduction number of your social innovations. And before long, it will catch on and other people will be remixing it to make it even faster, even more fair and even more fun. Thank you. I um, realized that these uh, comments from these speakers actually echo each other. You know, that this small practice, uh, as Otosan mentioned, uh, is uh, to meet these three criteria that the fast, fair and the fun. Then you know, people looking at the other, the field next door, oh, maybe we can do something you know, similar and yeah. we can do something else. And that will e e eventually the, um, the harmonize all the, the movement mm -hmm. uh, towards like a more innovative society. Good? Okay. Good. Um, so um, thank you, uh, Odoli. Thank you, Ota-san. Uh, and uh, I think this is a very nice way uh, to do a tone setting for these two days uh, sessions. Um, as you know that these uh, data and the participation is a very part of the very key concept of the impact management. We need to have a participation of beneficiaries, different stakeholders. We need to be transparent about the data we, we gathered. And we are trying to implement this uh, 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 the insight uh, as a result of analysis into the management. So management doesn't mean that management of company, but uh, it's a kind of a governance of the society itself. Good, so uh, thank you. So uh, this is the closing of the session. Um, and uh, thank you very much uh, for everybody to join in the session. Uh, let us know if you have a question to the Audley, Otasan, or ourselves. And the, as uh, Audley mentioned in the beginning, this is the uh, like a beginning of our, our collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.